Thank you very much for your patience uh, this evening. The good news is we won't be charging any extra for the warm-up act. <laughs> oh, it wasn't very good, was it? No, I know. <laughs> My name's Andrew Copps, and I'm the Chief Executive from the British Humanist Association, and the British Humanist Association is very pleased to present uh, this evening a conversation between P.Z. Myers and Richard Dawkins. P.Z. Myers is a biology professor at the University of Minnesota Morris, and the author, of the, science, the author of the science blog, Fringula, Evolution, Development, and Random Biological Ejaculations from a Godless Liberal. <laughs> He's a very public critic of the intelligent design and creationist movements in the US and around the world. Richard Dawkins uh, was the inaugural Charles Simonier Professor of the Public Understanding of Science at the University of Oxford, and is an honorary vice president of the... As long as that's not some sort of secret activist code, I think <laughs> the normal rules just apply and you should uh, all switch off your, off your mobiles. Thanks very much. His published works include The Selfish Gene, Unweaving the Rainbow, Climbing Mount Improbable, The Devil's Chaplain, The God Delusion, and many others all available in the foyer. Yes, yeah, they're all signed already. I know. We had nothing else to do back there. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the, sign the books. In the event of a fire or any similar incident, um, <laughs> the exits are visibly highlighted and safely secured by police officers. <laughs> so you'll be okay. But until that happens, I'm very pleased to present Richard Dawkins and PZ Mice. Well, PZ, or may I, be, <laughs> may I be informal and call you PZ? Either way works, yes. Um, I suppose we're both equally interested in science and in religion, or rather, unreligion. So I thought maybe I'd begin by telling you I'm going to Tenerife next week to discuss astrobiology or exobiology mm -hmm. with uh, various astronomers and people, and also Buzz Aldrin and... Neil Armstrong. I'm enormously looking forward to that. And what the conference is about, I think, is discussing the possibility of extraterrestrial life. Well, I think any evolutionist is going to be interested in, in that possibility. And the way I'm interested in it is to ask the question, how much of what we know about life on this planet had to be true, because that's the only way life can be? Can we already say something about it? In other words, can we already predict at least something about the way life might be outside this planet? Or is everything up for grabs? Should we allow our imagination to run completely riot and allow absolutely anything? I mean, uh -huh. Do you think we can put constraints on, on the sort of things we might expect to find? Yes and no. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to be giving a talk at the amazing meeting uh, in July, which is on, on a similar theme. And the kinds of things I, w I want to talk about is that, yes, there, there's, there seems to be phenomena that I suspect will be universal. I think Darwinian selection is going to be universal. Right, good. I kind of suspect that most life is going to be carbon-based. There's always a speculation about silicon-based life and, and things like that. But um, carbon seems to be the, the, the tool. That's the molecule, molecule we're going to use. Because it makes chains and branches and can form complex. Right, and, and it does those at a, a reasonable temperature that allows for rapid chemical reactions and uh, so that so that you can evolution happening in a reasonable amount of time. What I'll also be suggesting though is that there are some patterns that we do see over and over again in life in the history of life on this earth. And we, we can think of think of our evolutionary history as a, a, a little model of how it works. And uh, that for instance one argument I'll be making to annoy all this science fiction people and all the uh, NASA people is, is I, don't think, I don't think intelligence is very likely. It doesn't seem to come up very often. Not a lot of it here, is there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, but when you look at the, when you look at the history of life, what you find is, is you know, fangs and claws evolve a lot, and insulation evolves a lot, and sophisticated reproduction methods evolve a lot. But um, intelligence seems to be a rare thing that's only happened yes. recently. Yes, I mean, I, yeah. I once looked into this and suggested that we ought to do a account of the number of times that independently things evolve. As you say, fangs and claws, stings, eyes, mm -hmm. ears, echolocation, um, nervous systems. You can actually look around the animal kingdom since we now have a pretty fair idea of what the family tree of life, the entire family tree of life looks like. You can actually count the number of times that each of these things evolves independently. Mm -hmm. And um, that might give you a sort of idea of how eager, in a way, life is to evolve things. And as you say, I mean, eyes may have evolved some dozens of times. Echolocation seems to have evolved about four times, bats, mm -hmm. whales, um, and two families of birds. Um, but intelligence, apparently, only once. Um, Our kind of Language, yes. apparently, only yes. once, yes. Yeah, and, and it's not as if there was a lack of opportunity that, um, th this is an another theme that I think we can get into in, in evolutionary biology is, is this misconception that, that evolution is always progressive. That, yeah, we've seen, we've seen an increase in complexity, but, but when you get to like the Mesozoic, the Mesozoic fauna was no less complicated than the fauna now. They, they had the opportunity. They could have evolved yeah. intelligence, and now it didn't happen. I think that's right. I mean, certainly, if you look at the broad sweep of evolution from the start until now, then I would not expect to see anything progressive. I do expect to see progressive, though, on a shorter time scale, a time scale of, say, 10 million years, where you have the evolution of um, a complex organ like an eye. Uh -huh. I mean, the end, the end point of the evolution of, a, of an eye is massively complicated with lenses that focus and iris diaphragms that go in and out and complicated retinas and things. And that's probably happened many times. Right. Um, so you, it, it, would be, it would be nonsense to say that the evolution of something like an eye is not progressive. It's obviously got to be progressive because the end state that works is a far more efficient eye, has far more be better acuity, any measure of the eye that you care to name. But it's probably going to be a very short-term pro right. progression. Yeah, so that, for instance, our eye is is a, it's roughly 400 to 450 million years old. It was, it was fish that and, perfected and that's this right. and, general And most structure. of the perfection yeah. would have taken place early. That's right. In, in, in a rather short space of time. Yeah, and now what we do is we, we've got variations on a the theme. Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay, so um, you said um, you'd, you expect carbon, and that seems to me to make mm -hmm. sense. Um, the life as we know it depends upon the division of labor between DNA and protein, where DNA is brilliant at replication but lousy at being an enzyme, and protein can't replicate but is brilliant at being an enzyme. Um, would you expect to see the something like a, a polynucleotide protein partnership? And now we're getting into biochemistry, and who knows? Uh, yeah, yeah that, that what we see in the history of life, you know, there, there's the idea of the RNA world and where we have ribozymes that can do various things. But it seems to have been supplanted by a superior architecture. Yeah. And uh, so you can imagine an, an alien world that's still stuck in the RNA world phase. Yeah. Well, not were, RNA at all, but some other, or some, uh, some yeah. other molecule that can do both the self-replication task and the, and the uh, catalyzing mm -hmm. task. I sometimes, when I meet a biochemist, I, get them, I try to get them to speculate about whether they could imagine alternative biochemistries that are, say, based on carbon, but not necessarily based on, on polynucleotides and, and proteins. Right. And I never really get a straight answer from them, I'm afraid. I don't. Yeah, well, that's kind of beyond, beyond the limits of my imagination. I'll say that. And, and, and it's, it's deep in that, too, because we find that you know, life on Earth is relying on things like the Krebs cycle throughout. That there's, there's basic biochemical processes that seem to be everywhere, and they seem to be traceable back yeah. to the first. And did first that order. just happen to happen, or did it have to? I mean, that means that that's the yeah. sort of question. What about, does the genetics have to be digital, do you think? I mean, our, our genetics is, is digital, and some might say it has to be digital, otherwise it couldn't be accurate enough. Mutation rate would be too high, in other mm -hmm. words. 
And, and again, that would depend on the, on the biochemistry. I can't quite imagine the biochemistry for, for a fuzzy logic of inheritance. Yeah. And, and how that would be propagated is a, is a mystery. So, yeah, you're, you're stumping me there, too. I don't know. Um, anyway, I think it's, it's a worthwhile question for biologists to answer, not just how is life as a matter of fact, but how, how did it have to be? And yes. I think, I mean, I certainly agree with you that I think I agree with you that it had to be Darwinian, mm -hmm. because, well, certainly nobody's ever suggested anything other than Darwinian natural selection that could account for adaptive evolution. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that doesn't rule out the possibility that somebody might come up with something. Uh, yes. Now, I, th I think it might be easier to think of, of differences if we get away from the core fundamentals of the cell. That, there, there are these things like the Krebs cycle, like DNA R and RNA and protein differences that all life on Earth shares. But when you look at, when you look farther up the tree of life, there you do find interesting variations. So I, I'm a developmental biologist. And one thing about modern developmental biology is too many of us are biased towards animals. And there's a reason for it. It's that animals have really interesting patterns of development. And it, it, it's contingent on the fact that Animal cells are motile, they're free to move, whereas something like a plant cell is fixed. So when you look at the development of a plant, for instance, you don't see major cell migrations mm -hmm. like you would with neural crests mm -hmm. in animals. And so that, that, those are two very different patterns. There's nothing necessary about an organism, obviously, following the animal pattern. That what about a planet with a planet of plants, yeah. carnivorous plants, all slowly stalking across the landscape and chewing on each other. That would be cool. Uh, <laughs> and they'd have a very different pattern of development, a very different biology, a, you know, a very different mode of morphology than the animals we're familiar with. Right, so in, in plant development, a cell tends to stay where it is and, and then just right. the thing grows at merry stems. It, yes, it stacks uh, its progeny, yes. and those progeny then yes. go on for di to yeah. different fates. So that would be another question then. How how, how universal are the principles of embryology? Um, and I think that, that answers it right there. They're not. There's, they're not. They're obviously not, because we know they're not here. But we don't have any examples of an analog genetics. The only no. genetics we know is digital. Indeed, it's DNA or, or RNA. Um, what about sex? I mean, sex clearly isn't inevitable, because not all, not all animals Correct. do it. Not all plants do it. Um, so anyway, I'm looking forward to this conference, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm at, too, because one, one, one of the things I'm planning to do with this talk is I'm going to poke fun at all those science fiction stories. I, you can get me <coughs> ranting and raving talking about Star Trek. Okay, <laughs> aliens that differ by bumpy heads, and they can interbreed. Oh, man. It's <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, well, that gets us back to what we were talking about before, about the the predictability. I mean, one could probably predict that on any planet that has, uh, well, all planets have got to have, a, have light, they've got to have a sun. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's not shrouded in fog, we can pretty much predict that eyes will evolve, because yes. they've evolved so many times here. Um, if Although we could, imagine, we could imagine something like the, these moons of the gas giants, where there's thought to be liquid water deep under the ice. And they're probably metabolizing sulfur if there's life, if right. there's life at all there. So you can imagine a life that's built on that different biochemistry where, it's, where the energy source is not the it's sun. Not, it's, it's not from the, the sun. So, the, so they live in a world of darkness. Yes. And yeah, yes. Good. Okay. You know, <laughs> strange thing is you're actually very nice. <laughs> don't, I can you get, don't you get told that? It's kind of annoying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've got this blog where I, I try to, you know, pr keep this, this reputation going of me as the ferocious, vicious, brutal atheist who disembowels my opponents, but then I get on a stage with you and uh, maybe it's just that you look much meaner than I do. <laughs> it is a, a remarkable fact, actually, that um, we, we I, I certainly, and you as well, in your case it's more deserved, but... Um, <laughs> um, have a reputation for being, well, aggressive and um, yeah. arrogant and, and rude, strident, shrill, yeah. militant, yeah, yeah. fanatical. I, yes, we have lots of adjectives yeah. that get thrown at us. So, <clears throat> yeah. 
We, we need to hire a public relations firm to, um, <laughs> to clean up our act. Although I, I find it's, it's actually kind of useful you know, that when you get these critics, these creationists, for instance, that are, that are shouting at us how, how even wicked we are, like this fellow telling you, you you're for profit. And then you can so neatly circumvent the entire argument, you can undermine them completely by mentioning, oh, my, my lecture money all goes to charity, or I stand up here and I have a pleasant conversation with people. And suddenly they're shown to be wrong, which is very useful. Yeah. Oh, yes, maybe Louder. we need the mics turned up. Is, is it both of us or...? Well, it's just me. Let me slide this. Okay, is this better? Yeah. All right. Uh, what about me? Can you hear me? Okay. okay. <laughs> okay, from now on, every other word will be profanity. Would I <laughs> Well, that's another thing, though. Uh, I often get accused of... Uh, there's a guy who recently wrote about me and said my, my talk was all laced with profanity. Do you get this? Uh, no, because oh. mine isn't. <laughs> uh, okay, well, mine isn't either. I might, uh, yeah. I might occasionally throw out a, a, a little juicy word, but it's... it's well, no, it of... depends what they mean. And, and there are certain people whose ear is so tuned to hearing anything anti-religious as profanity that yes. um, you've only got to say something incredibly mild like it's possible to be good without God and they'll hear that as a profanity yes. because it's deeply, uh, deeply insulting. Yeah, I, I, I wrote a blog post a while back in which I, I chewed out a rabbi who had completely distorted what I'd said in some, some other write-up and I, the, the entire post was dissecting his argument and showing that it was wrong, that it was fallacious. And immediately after that, I got these replies from the rabbi about how I should avoid being so insulting and rude and crude. There wasn't one four-letter, well, some four-letter words, but they were the nice ones. There were, there were no nasty words in there. Um, there, were, there were no ad hominems. I did not even call him an idiot, although I felt it. <laughs> And still, in his head, he translated it as, you've criticized me, yeah. therefore you've yeah. attacked me. If you criticize somebody's religion, if they're devout enough, they'll take it as being, a, as though you said they've got an ugly face or something. Yes. That sort. Um, I'm fascinated by an argument which was uh, raised by Steve Zara and you kind of independently. And it was really a, a curious thing for me because I'd always paid lip service to the idea that... Um, I, as a scientist, would immediately back down and say, yes, yes, I believe in God if good evidence were provided. Mm -hmm. And that's a natural thing for any scientist to say, and I would be delighted to do that. But then I've always worried, what actually would the evidence look like? Um, yeah. And um, Steve Zara and you, both independently, sort of said that you couldn't imagine any kind of evidence that would convince you of anything supernatural, even a a great booming Paul Robeson voice saying, I exist, <laughs> uh, would not be enough to... Um, and right. I, I can sort of see that. And we yeah, and I, I, I came right out and said it. I, I said flatly that there is no evidence that will convince me of the existence of a God. And the reason is that there's, there's two components here, and, and we all know this as scientists that what you do in order to do science is that you formulate a hypothesis. You set up a hypothesis which you can test, which you can make observations or experiments and actually evaluate whether your hypothesis is true or false. So the hypothesis making part of the science is, is almost as important as the evidence gathering part of it. And so we talk about gathering evidence for God, but you haven't defined the hypothesis yet. So, yes, you could say, well, you know, my God is the, the being who will shout out through the atmosphere that I exist. And then you could say, yeah, okay, you can, you can find an example of that. But that is, that is not a God that is proposed by any religion. Uh, I suggested, well, what about a 900-foot-tall Jesus that strides across the land with laser beams shooting out of his eyes, <laughs> which would be kind of cool and terrifying, but then what, what would happen is 
you would show me evidence of a 900 foot tall Jesus and I'd say okay there is a 900 foot tall Jesus let's do some experiments on it <laughs> and it wouldn't convince me of a God at all and, and that's that's essential that that step of defining what you are what you're looking for somebody could for instance tell me that that some pretty beetle they found is their god because it's got a spectacular pattern of iridescence on its wing covers. And we could measure it, and we could look at it, and we could observe it and say, yes, it does have a spectacular pattern of iridescence. But does that make it a god? No. That's, that's no reasonable definition of one. So somebody will have to give me a, a good, clear explanation yeah. of what I'm looking for. So you need a definition. I mean, yes. what about anything Anything supernatural, it seems to me that to resort to a supernatural explanation for something is to give up all aspiration to investigate it. So if uh, somebody pr showed himself able to predict next week's lottery number or something of uh -huh. that sort, um, would that be supernatural, or would that be a very clever conjuring trick, or would it be? Yes. Um, would it be? Uh, he'd got inside knowledge. I mean, it would be it, a very profitable conjuring trick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I suppose it's it's rather similar to Hume on miracles that you don't accept yeah. evidence for a miracle unless the possibility of it being a hoax or a conjuring trick or a lie or something is would be more miraculous than mm. the, than the miracle itself. Yes. You know, and I, I've, I've been strongly influenced by the skeptics movement. And, and what you find in the skeptics movement is, is, is lots of people who are professional magicians and, and do these tricks. You know, people like James Randi or Darren Brown or an, any of these well-known conjurers. And they can do things that we can't explain. Yeah, exactly. And J as James Randi often says, scientists are really easy to fool yeah. because we have expectations about how things will be done. We, we, we tend to assume that people won't cheat on us. So that's one factor, is, is most of these things I, I suspect will be tricks. And what I would say if I saw something I could not explain is, I'm going to call James Randi right now. <laughs> and, and he'll probably tell me, oh, this, this is something that's in a, in a magic textbook from 1890. It's routine. The other phenomenon, though, is, is this whole idea of the supernatural. What is the supernatural? That, um, you know, what seems to me to be supernatural is something that is outside this universe that cannot affect this universe. If you've got a supernatural force that is having a natural effect, we can examine the natural effect. That, for instance, if, if prayer actually worked as people say it should, you could say that's a supernatural force. That's, that's a, a, a being outside of our universe that's influencing us. But its influence could be measured. So, and, and, and of course, a supernatural force that does not have a measurable effect on the natural world is irrelevant. We don't care. I'm not sure why you'd even call it supernatural, though, because uh, if you put, go back in time to medieval times, then a Boeing 747, a computer, a mobile phone, oh, yeah. uh, would all appear to be supernatural. And I imagine that in 500 years' time, the technology of that mm -hmm. time will be so far advanced over ours that we would think it was supernatural. Uh, Clark's third law, um, right. any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, so I think it's an act of cowardice to say, because I can't understand something, um, I'm going to call it supernatural. I think we should call it instead, we don't understand it yet, and we need to, right. we need to, uh, to work on it. Yes, and that's why I say if there was a 900 foot tall Jesus, uh, my, my approach would be not to assume it's supernatural, not to assume it's a god, but to assume this is a really interesting phenomenon that we've got to start examining as scientists. I agree. And that's, yeah. that's how we should treat yes. all these religious, yes. these religious claims. Is here's something we ought to examine, and with the understanding that what we'll probably get is, is something that's explainable in natural means. But the, the devil's advocate then would say, um, would there ever come a point when you would give up and say, well, we seem to have failed and failed and failed and failed to understand it, therefore it's supernatural? I, I would never say that, I don't think. No. I, there, are, there are phenomena I can imagine, I, I, well, there are phenomena I can't imagine that we will understand in my lifetime. So, that, for instance, the functioning of the brain. We will understand bits and pieces of it, but the totality of its functioning will not, because it's so immensely complex. Um, 
I will not at any point say, well, we don't understand everything yet, therefore I give up and there must be a ghost in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's an admission of failure and it's, and, and, and in a sense that's what religion really is, is a total admission of failure, that they cannot imagine a way to proceed, so let's invent a shortcut. Yeah. I mean, it's an admission of failure, but they glory in it. I mean, they actually... <laughs> They enjoy mystery for its own sake. I mean, to, to you and me, a mystery is a challenge. It's something that, that wants to be solved, and we want to solve it. But there are people who love mystery, and they, and they actively resent it being solved. Yes. I mean, Michael Shermer has a story of um, when he went on stage and unmasked a spiritualist who was communicating with the dead, so-called, and Michael Shermer had examined the conjuring trick this man was using and he exposed it before the audience so that they understood what this conjurer who was masquerading as a spiritualist was doing. And members of the audience were furious. They came up to him afterwards and bitterly attacked him for disillusioning them, for actually telling them what was, what was really going on. So there are people who just don't want to know, who are uncomfortable mm -hmm. with understanding and would rather not understand. And, and it's, a, it's a fundamental thing. Uh, another issue that I often get criticized for is, is I'm accused of being a fundamentalist atheist. Oh, yeah. And you get this too. Oh, yes. And, and then on the other hand, what's often said is, is uh, what, what's often told me is, well, you shouldn't worry about the moderate Christian, you shouldn't worry about the moderate Muslims. It's those, those extremist fanatics and the fact that I go after anyone, I mean, I'll attack Unitarians, okay? I'll go after anyone, is, is a sign that I must be some kind of absolutist, some fundamentalist. But what it really gets down to is faith, that we have a culture that regards faith as a virtue, and faith is promoted in all of these religions, even the most moderate liberal religions you can think of. And if, if you're fundamental, again, I'm using fundamental, okay, so you're going to say, I am a fundamentalist atheist, okay, this is my fundamental core, is, no, I, I will not tolerate this excuse of faith, of wallowing in ignorance as an answer to things, and it goes all across the board in religion. So, no, I can't just attack the fanatics, I will go after the Methodists and the Anglicans and the Unitarians and and the Buddhists and whoever. And the reason, the reason is that they, they teach children that faith is a virtue. Yes. And, of course, they're nice and mild and gentle and things, but if you teach children that it's, it's a good thing to believe something just because you have faith and you don't have to justify it, then those children are going to grow up and a minority of them are going mm -hmm. to say, well, my faith tells me to go and bomb skyscrapers and things like that. So the, the moderate religious people have this pernicious influence of glorifying faith yes. and actually making it a positive virtue. Doubting Thomas was the least admired of the apostles, the patron saint of scientists. He actually wanted evidence. Uh -huh. uh, uh, but, but we are taught as, as children that it's better to believe without evidence than to believe with evidence. Right. And, and that is the fuse that can, after a long burning, can produce true fanaticism, which is violent and dangerous. Yeah. And we, and we come back to a, a point that was made earlier. Uh, I, I consider the opposite of faith to be criticism. And we come from a scientific culture that values critical thinking, that values argument and criticism, which is antithetical to what you do when you're favoring faith. In faith, you're not supposed to question things. Or, if, or, or what you'll often hear from, from the religious is, is, yes, you're supposed to question things, but it's, it's okay as long as you come up with the right answer, which is <laughs> that you go on believing. I hear um, countless stories of children being thrown out of Sunday school for simply asking questions. I mean, oh, yeah. like I met a man last week in Dublin who said that he was thrown out of Sunday school because he asked the teacher, but why did only Noah's Ark float? Why didn't all the other boats float? LAUGHTER